Dr. Wynn, and welcome to Facts and Faith Friday. Um, and um, this is being hosted uh, by uh, the VCU, Massey Cancer Center, VCU, and uh, the Virginia Department of Health. Um, the next voice you hear is going to be from that of Rudeen Mercer Haynes. Um, and she is, uh, first of all, people, if you don't know her, you ought to know her. She is just outstanding. She's from the uh, partner at the Hutton Andrews Kurth, you know, legal practice. She's uh, part of the Massey uh, Advisory Board member, and she's also a, a part of this, uh, actually one of the, the founders of the Facts Faith Friday. Uh, so I'll turn things over to uh, Redeem Mercer Haynes, because as all of us that are part of Facts Faith and Friday know, we don't get anything started without Sister Rudeen saying it's okay. So Rudeen, pass Thank the mic you. to you. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. Um, I too have the privilege of welcoming each of you to this installment of Facts and Faith Friday. Um, hopefully you had an opportunity to join us last week when we had Dr. Anthony Fauci presenting and a Q&A regarding the COVID vaccinations. Um, but today we are so, so very fortunate to have with us Dr. Ned Sharpless, the director of the National Cancer Institute. And he's here to speak with us about the impact of COVID on cancer. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or you're not as familiar with the Facts and Faith Friday series, um, this weekly conversation began back in March of 2020 with the sole purpose of cultivating a bridge of trust between the medical community and the black faith community. Recognizing the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, and in particular black and Latinx communities, um, Dr. Wynn, Pastor F. Todd Gray and I considered it incredibly important to disseminate credible, factual and medically sound information regarding this deadly virus to our black faith leaders and their congregations. Facts and Faith Fridays became the perfect forum for this discussion. During the course of the, our weekly conversations, we have also had the great opportunity to discuss a range of, um, a wide range of social and racial justice issues that affect black faith congregations throughout the Commonwealth. We could not be more you know, grateful for the enthusiastic participation by our Richmond concerned clergy, um, black clergy, many of them you'll hear today on today's call, um, as we've tried to do our best in navigating during these really crazy and extraordinary times. Um, as is our custom, we don't start anything un unless we start with prayer. And I'd like to ask my pastor, Pastor F. Todd Gray, to open our conversation with prayer. My video is not on, but let us bow. <coughs> Our Lord and our God as ever, we honor you. And we thank you for every opportunity that you grant that we might gather like this. We thank you for all the participants on this call. We thank you for those who coordinated and made it a possibility. Help us in these powerful and sometimes painful days that we might utilize all those things that you have put at our disposal to better minister to our people in an intelligent and informed fashion. And as the surgeon, uses the scalpel, we realize that you use the scientific and the medical community to advance the healing that you provide. So open our ears, our hearts, that we might receive what is shared today. Ultimately, that your people might be edified and your name be glorified. In the name of the master, we pray, amen. Amen. Um, they, um Next voice uh, that you, I don't think I can turn on my video, but that's actually okay. Um, the next voice that you will be hearing from <clears throat> will be that of um, Dr. Art Kellerman. He is um, my, uh, I mean, he is really, I think the, uh, the foundation of what we do a lot at here at uh, VCU and certainly VCU Massey. He is the vice president and, and, and executive CEO um, of our uh, health science uh, sort of side of things. And in fact, um, he won't say this, but I, I think that um, uh, his leadership style has been one in which we believe, uh, and I, you know, right from the first time of meeting him, is built on just meaning what he says and, and saying what he means. And in fact, I think one of the things he said when he first took over is that he really wanted to make a difference in obviously building, you know, top notch excellent science and top notch excellent doctors but he also wanted to make sure that our communities were healthy. And that I believe is really the, the thing that is uh, running throughout the whole DNA 
of uh, VCU. So without further ado, Dr. Kellerman. Thank you, Dr. Wynn and Dr. Sharples. Thank you for being with us today as well. Uh, the National Cancer Institute is a driving force for improving cancer care in this country. And uh, the handful of cancer centers, not more than 4% in the country are National Cancer Institute cancer centers. The Massey Cancer Centers had that designation almost from the beginning in 1975. Um, and that's because it combines really compassionate patient care with cutting edge science to not just do the best cancer care we know today, but define what can be even better to improve survival, not just to benefit the patients who come to Massey, but everybody with cancer in the country. And I'm really thrilled to be a part of this because I, like many of you, my family has borne a burden of cancer. Just before the pandemic started, my oldest brother died from metastatic lung cancer. So I, I, this is personal for me as it is for most Americans. And the other reason is Massey doesn't just have brains, it also has a heart. And, and I'll have to say exhibit A in my book is your friend and colleague, Dr. Rob Wynn. And all of you who gather here every Friday to exchange thoughts and ideas. Um, as he's already said, while we're both specialists, um, he and I are passionate about public health, prevention, community development, and primary care. And that is core to any high-performing health system and any successful community. Now, we all know we can't get together these days without acknowledging COVID-19, which is the biggest pandemic our country has faced in 102 years. It has already killed 370,000 Americans, almost as many as died in four years of World War II. And it is falling disproportionately and unfairly on the African-American community and other communities of color. And meanwhile, cancer isn't taking the day off. Uh, it continues to be relentless and we have both fights to win and many others. But that's why it's so good to have somebody of Dr. Sharpless's caliber with us today. And I just wanna to say to all of you regulars on this call, how much I respect and admire you and what you do for your congregations for this community. At a time when so many people wanna divide Americans, you keep drawing us back, you and the power of the Lord, that you're speaking on behalf of. Uh, and that is incredibly important. And Rob understands that and I understand that, which is why we're glad to do this. And I'll tell you what, you all are already having a heck of an impact on Dr. Wynn because he's a better preacher now than when I met him just a few months ago. So with that, thank you, Dr. Sharples, for sharing your wisdom. And I'm gonna hand the podium back to Dr. Wynn. Thank you, Dr. Kellerman. Um, I uh, just want to get started by, uh, you know, uh, telling a little bit about Dr. Sharpless and um, his bio is more than impressive. Um, you know, right from the early days, uh, I think folks could, uh, that knew that Dr. Sharpless was something just uh, outstanding. He's a Moorhead scholar at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where he received his degree in mathematics. He went on to pursue a medical degree at uh, UNC School of Medicine. Uh, graduating with honors and distinctions. He then completed internal medicine residency at, a, at Mass General, Massachusetts General Hospital, and a hematology oncology fellowship at Dana-Farber, uh, both Harvard medical schools, uh, which are in Boston. He, his list of accomplishments are incredible. And I have to say that we were all very happy when he was appointed uh, to serve uh, as the, uh, back in the day, as the director of the Lindbergh Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC, a position he held to 2014, because for, for a lot of us uh, who were in the cancer field and uh, those who came after before, uh, we always looked to Dr. Sharpless and his leadership as a cancer center director to understand um, the difficulties uh, the obstacles, as well as the, the, the amazing things it is, of, uh, but the hard work it is of being a cancer center director. So it was with great glee um, that when he was sworn in as the 15th director of the NCI, the National Cancer Institute on October uh, of 2017, it for many cancer center directors and people who were just in the, you know, the field of cancer, we were all really overjoyed. Dr. Sharpless, I have to say, uh, which would not pop up in his bio, has been a fearless, 
uh, and staunch advocate to diversity in the context of uh, diversifying the workforce, but also bringing different voices to the table because as, um, as as many hallway conversations I've had, it's it, it's not just something that's good, it's something that's necessary. And I have to say that uh, with the NCI Cancer Center directors, you know, you you won't hear a bad word about Dr. Sharpless from any of us. And in fact, I have the utmost respect for him. And so without further ado, I want to, I could go on and on, but I won't. I am going to uh, let uh, Dr. Sharpless uh, talk to you. Um, and so the next voice you hear will be that of Dr. Sharpless. Thank you, sir. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to do this. I'm really excited for the opportunity. Uh, I want to, you know, the, the NCI uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center program really is, you know, one of the crown jewels of the National Cancer Institute. It's these really awesome, you know, cancer centers that commit to outstanding care and outstanding research. And certainly the VCU Massey is one of, one of the real, real pearls of that program. And so it's really great to come talk to people who live within the so-called catchment area of that program. So, so the, the people who benefit from that cancer center and um, talk to you about what's going on at the NCI. And also I wanna thank my uh, good friend, Robert Wynn for inviting me. Although I'm a little miffed at Rob for making me go after Tony Fauci. Uh, Tony is a, a tough ax to follow. Uh, Tony's a national treasure. I work closely with Dr. Fauci at the NCI's offices, like four stories, four, four floors below mine. And, uh, you know, uh, he's uh, on Saturday Night Live now and stuff. So uh, thank you, Rob, for making me follow Tony. But in any event, uh, it's a real treat to talk about what, uh, what's going on. Uh, maybe I also ought to say one other thing before I get started, which is um, I live in Woodley Park in D.C. And, you know, uh, I think probably an area many of you know. And um, it's a really strange time in the nation's capital. It's pretty close to where the vice president lives here. There are a lot of black SUVs driving around. There are helicopters flying overhead. There's a new fence around the Naval Observatory where the vice president lives. The mall is fenced off. It, it, it feels a little bit like an occupation. There's 6,000 National Guard in town. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sad uh, that uh, we need this level of security, but I think last week's events in the Capitol were you know, utterly sickening and uh, very disturbing. And I can really only hope that as a nation, we can find our shared values and, and come together around those shared values and uh, try and figure a way forward. Um, and the good news there, if there is any good news, uh, you know, it's not great news, but, you know, in some respects, this issue, you know, making progress against cancer is a bipartisan thing that everybody in America wants to do. There's no ideology. Uh, this is just an area where we all we all want to see and make progress. And, and so in some ways, the, the work of the National Cancer Institute, which feels just so normal and so refreshingly apolitical in these strange and challenging times, it's, 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 it's a, a real, as I said, a, it, it's great to be working on this important mission during such an important, uh, challenging time. But uh, having against that backdrop, you know, the pandemic year, and uh, you know the turmoil, the social turmoil, and now the uh, the, the trauma of the most recent weeks. Uh, it actually is a productive time for cancer research, as I, I will make the argument that we are uh, still making great progress against cancer. The pandemic has caused a lot of problems that I'll talk about, but um, you know I, I believe I fully believe that we can get back on track here, that we can continue that great uh, tra the trajectory we've been on in terms of cancer research and really make a difference for all our patients. So next slide, please. So just as background, uh, you know, it, you, one has to point out that um, the story in cancer research over the last few years had been pretty good. So uh, mortality from cancer in the United States peaked in the early 1990s, and then had been slowly declining for the last few decades, mostly because of tobacco control. So cigarettes caused a lot of cancer as people stopped smoking, uh, lung cancer and other types of cancer that are caused by cigarette smoking. Uh, declined. And that was a kind of a steady, slow rate uh, where we'd seen a lot of progress. And then maybe in the last decade or so, uh, that rate of decline has accelerated. And now we're seeing more cancer mortality drop at an even faster rate. So this is a headline from two, three days ago in the Wall Street Journal that the American Cancer Society, which does an annual review of these statistics, declared that 2017-18, uh, which is the last year for which data are available, 
had the largest decrease in cancer mortality in the history of our statistics. And the prior year, 2016, 2017, that was the largest decrease uh, in, in, in statistics at its time. So the last two years, in other words, have been uh, quite good, almost a 5% decrease in cancer mortality in just that short a period, uh, which is m much faster than the pace had been for, for decades. And that's because of a lot of things. That's because of uh, better screening for cancer, prevention, less smoking, more vaccine use, uh, but also better treatments and the treatments that are more effective that help patients survive with cancer longer or even cure patients with cancer. So there, there had been good news in cancer research uh, and, 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 and progress for, for many, many reasons against this complex set of diseases. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. And uh, the pandemic has disrupted cancer care in ways that I'll talk about. But I wanna say at the outset that I consider one of the biggest challenges for the National Cancer Institute right now is trying to how to figure out how to get back on track, how to take this great progress we were seeing, get past this disruption and, 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 and the, the bad effects of the pandemic and get back to this, this period where we're making progress for patients with cancer. Next slide, please. Here's another way of showing those data. This is a graph of cancer mortality. It's age adjusted for the population in the United States. And you can see for both men and women, it's the trend I described where you know, in, mortality peaks in the early 1990s. And for men, it drops pretty fast and accelerating in recent years. And for, for women, not quite as fast, but also accelerating in recent years. Uh, and uh, as I said, this is a complicated, lots of things go into this. Uh, this also hides the fact that um, you know, while we've made a lot of progress in certain cancers like, you know, non-small cell lung cancer and melanoma and leukemia, lymphoma, those tumors were, were making more progress. There are other kinds of cancer like pancreatic cancer or brain cancer where um, uh, we haven't made much progress, where the mortality is pretty much flat. Uh, there is, it hasn't been these sorts of gains. So the, these aggregate data hide the fact that our, our progress in cancer is not uniform. In some diseases, it's really good. And, and very strong, and in other diseases, we still have a lot more to do. And uh, so that's really the task of the National Cancer Institute. Though. We just can't work on the easy cancers, the simplest problems. We have to try and you know, address all cancer for the United States, for the American public. And uh, you know, that is our focus. We wanna make progress to, you know, to benefit every patient uh, to, so that you know, we can end, end cancer suffering in the United States is our, our stated mission. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the pandemic has caused problems in a, in a couple of different ways. So one is that if you're, it, it'll delay the diagnosis of cancer because patients can't go to the, the doctor, they can't go to the clinic. So if patients don't go in for their screening procedure, they don't go in for their mammography, their mammogram, they don't get their colonoscopy, they don't have their PSA, their prostate test checked. If those tests aren't done, then that cancer may not get diagnosed. But if it's a significant cancer, it will eventually come to light later. And so that will, will cause a delay in diagnosis. Generally, cancer is easier to treat if we catch it earlier. So those delays in diagnosis because of decreased screening or decreased doctor's visits in general, you know, much cancer, the majority of cancers are actually diagnosed when a patient has a new symptom, they have pain or they have a new lump and they go to their doctor and get it evaluated. But that declined during the pandemic as well because patients didn't want to leave their house. Uh, hospitals and clinics were closed to preserve prior, you know, preserve uh, you know capabilities for the hospital. So, for a variety of reasons, we've seen a dramatic drop off in cancer diagnoses during the pandemic, perhaps cut in half. And there's no reason to believe that the incidence of cancer has declined by half during this period. So, we think many, most of those cancers that we've not been diagnosing during the pandemic are just going to come to light later at later stage and they're gonna be harder to treat. Another problem has been that uh, patients haven't been able to get their care. Even though they have cancer or, may, or, or, or need a procedure for their cancer, they've been unable to get it because hospitals and clinics have been closed. So we've seen delays of chemotherapy, delays of surgery, delays of radiation oncology. And when you delay treatment and postpone treatment, we also know that that leads to less good outcome and that, that will increase mortality. And then we've also seen, you know, doctors kind of do uh, different things because the pandemic has had to, has changed the way we practiced. So a lot of care has moved to telehealth instead of, you know, going to the doctor's office, you do it by the phone. And we've had to change how often people would come into clinics. And a lot of that is not a big deal. We think we can do quite a bit by telehealth safely, but 
When you change therapy and give non-standard care, we worry that the outcomes won't be as good. So for these reasons, we're expecting the pandemic will increase cancer mortality for a while. And we think this may, these effects may last for as long as 10 years after the pandemic because of de decreased screening and diagnosis. So the, the bad news is that good progress we've been seeing against cancer mortality is going to be upset and interrupted by the pandemic. And, and our challenge as those of us interested in taking care of patients with cancer is to figure out how to not let this happen, how to make the impact of the pandemic on our patients as little as possible. Next slide, please. So here's a way of presenting all that data that you know, Time Magazine has a nice display of this. It tells the story of decreased screening of cancer, decreased diagnosis of cancer, decreased treatment and delayed treatment of cancer, and all of this turns into excess cancer mortality. And you know, we've done some modeling in the National Cancer Institute, and we think this could be as much as a 1% increase in cancer mortality uh, over the next decade, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when we consider that still in the United States, 600,000 Americans die of cancer every year, you know, even a 1% boost is something we really want to worry about. So as I said, our challenge is to not let this happen. Next slide, please. I also want to talk a bit about the topic of, of cancer health disparities. And I thought I'd introduce that topic by talking about the racial disparity that exists uh, for patients with cancer who also get COVID infection. So a disparity in, 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 in healthcare research means when a certain population does less well than a different population, often in the setting of some reason why that second population is, the population that does less well is disadvantaged. So the NCI is very interested in cancer health disparities, what causes them. And some of the disparities we study, for example, are disparities between individuals of different races. Why do African-American patients do less well with lung cancer than white patients with lung cancer. You know, it's lung cancer. We ought to be able to have every patient in the United States get similar benefits, similar treatment, and, and, and have similar outcomes. So understanding the causes of these disparities is a real focus of research. And actually, uh, I should mention an area of real research excellence at, uh, at VCU. Uh, so um, disparities are always complicated. They can be caused by lots of things, social uh, reasons, access to care, education, uh, you know, socioeconomic status, uh, geography, rural populations have a significant uh, disparity in the United States in terms of outcomes for cancer care, rural versus urban populations. So they're complicated to understand, but you can't really do anything about them unless you really understand what causes them. So that's why it's, a, it's such an important scientific question. In, in COVID, there is a very clear racial disparity, both in terms of uh, needing to get admitted to the hospital, so getting a bad case of COVID, so that you have to be uh, so bad that you have to be hospitalized, and then also of dying of COVID. Uh, and but those data are shown here. So you can see that in patients with cancer or without cancer, African American patients who uh, who develop COVID do less well. They're more likely to be hospitalized, and they're more likely to die of COVID. And, uh, and if they have cancer and COVID, that's even worse because cancer generally uh, makes patients, um, they, it may weaken their immune system, it may impair their nutrition, they're just less fit, they're frailer than patients without cancer. And then th when those, those patients who have cancer, but maybe their cancer's under control, maybe it's manageable, and then they get infected with COVID, they do less well. And so that's a sort of a double whammy. And we really, the NCRI are really trying to understand which populations of patients with cancer are most affected by COVID and are most vulnerable by COVID. But uh, you know, I, th th this, uh, the, the, the racial disparity with regard to COVID has become quite obvious in cancer population and is, 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 is something I think that we need to figure out and address. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example of some of the other disparities in the United States that the NCI really focuses on. So I, I, I talked about, um, the, the, uh, the COVID outcome disparity is a problem. There's a big disparity in terms of cancer mortality between black men and white men with regard to prostate cancer. In fact, the, of the overall difference in cancer mortality between uh, black, black individuals and white individuals with regard to cancer, almost half of that difference, a very significant fraction of that mortality difference is attributable just to prostate cancer alone. So what causes that difference is an area of active research and uh, the NCI has many, many studies going on to try and figure this out. 
There's also different incidence rates of several cancers that are much higher in rural Appalachia than in urban regions, regions, regions of the area, of the country rather. And so th this, uh, you know, access uh, issues that are, are present in, ur in rural populations can be a real challenge for delivering care and for delivering cancer screening and are, are associated with worse outcomes. And despite having similar rates of breast cancer, African-American women are more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. And that is a complex disparity because it turns out that breast cancer is not so simple. There are multiple different types, and it, but even within certain subtypes of breast cancer, African-American women do less well than white women. And so understanding that is an important research effort. And then for example, American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest rates of liver and bile duct cancer, followed by Hispanic and Latino patients and Asian Pacific Islander patients. So that's an important disparity in that population and understanding it is critical as well. So this is a, a vibrant part of the NCI's portfolio is to try and understand why certain populations do less well. You know, I mentioned that good news, that progress against cancer that we're seeing, but often what we're seeing is that those, those research advances, those new ideas, that great new therapy is only working so well in these, you know, tertiary care uh, medical centers, you know, an academic medical center or a, a big cancer center where patients have to may drive three hours to get to. And if we can't then implement those same discoveries and advances to all patients in all populations in the community setting, in the rural setting, uh, that, that's not fair. So we really want to try and address these access issues and figure out why they, why they exist and what we can do about them. Next slide, please. Uh, I alluded to this before, this shows uh, the uh, cancer incidence and mortality rates uh, by race in the United States. Uh, so incidence is how many new cases do we have a year, and then death rates or mortality or how many deaths we have a year. And so you can see incidence is uh, lower for certain populations like uh, Asian Pacific Islanders and American Indian populations. Uh, and it's pretty comparable between blacks and whites, but deaths, there's a bigger difference where you see uh, that African-American patients have, a, uh, have an increased death rate from cancer compared to other populations. And as I said, a substantial fraction of that is attributable to prostate cancer, but there are other cancers like breast cancer and stomach cancer and endometrial or uterine cancer that have an important African-American white disparity as well. All of these are complicated things. They all are multifactorial. But if you want to do anything about them, you got to figure them out and, 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 then, and then interrupt them in that way or fix them in that way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, before I, 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 I close, and, and I really hope we have time for a lot of uh, questions, I, I'd be happy to hear what your concerns are. But before I do that, I wanted to point out that we have several resources for cancer patients in the United States. So if you're interested in... Um, uh, clinical trials or research or even information about uh, care, we uh, you can go to our website, cancer.gov, or our, or our phone line, 1-800-4-CANCER, and uh, we can provide advice and information and guidance, or, or you can actually contact tech, us by email. Uh, these are heavily used resources. We provide a lot of, of uh, guidance to patients and caregivers throughout the country on a regular basis. These are heavily used. We also have a lot of information on our websites related to COVID and cancer. So, you know, can my surgery be delayed? What does it mean if I have a, you know, if I have a test, a positive test and I'm a cancer patient, you know, these kinds of questions. So those are addressed on our website as well. It's a wealth of information for those of you who have further questions. So with that, I will close and just once again, thank, uh, thank Dr. Wynn and others for inviting me today. And uh, I really appreciate your interest in the National Cancer Institute. And uh, I'd, be I'd be really interested in hearing uh, what's on your mind on this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, that is fantastic. Uh, and we do have a, a number of questions. Um, so we're gonna get started uh, by having do uh, Dr. Jerome Ross, uh, pastor of Providence Park Baptist Church, um, ask a, a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharpless, for sharing with us. Just have a few questions and some of the things you have informed us about and need to address some of these questions. I just have a few ones. Um, will the COVID vaccination impact or affect treatment for cancer? I'm thinking 
do the chemicals call different kinds of effects with one another? Uh, I'll, let me share them all and then you can pick and choose because they may be related. Uh, is it possible to distinguish the symptoms of the two, the COVID versus the cancer? Are they similar or can you distinguish them? Is there a priority for treatment? Should one take precedence over the other? And then a last one was uh, just an uh, afterthought. Um, what is the arrangement for, for lack of a better word, distribution or administration of the vaccination? How can protocol be established and sent out? I, my mom is concerned and I'm of that age too. You know, and how should we go, what should we go about doing that? Should we call to, will we get information about it? Those kinds of things. Sure. Um... Let me take those in order. So I think the first question was, uh, can patients with cancer get vaccinated or, or should they be vaccinated? And will that's they affect depend, each other? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and will they work? You know, will the vaccine work in people with cancer, for example? Mm -hmm. the, the answer to this, I think, depends a little bit on the patient, right? Um, mm -hmm. Patients who are uh, in the middle of chemotherapy, particularly for, you know, hematologic or blood cancers, mm -hmm. uh, we know from prior experience that sometimes they respond, the response to a vaccine isn't as potent, uh, meaning they don't get as much immunity from it. But uh, that's not the majority of patients. We think that most patients uh, with cancer, either they, or even if they're during treatment, but if, particularly if they completed treatment, should be able to get the vaccine uh, when recommended by the local public health authorities. And, and, and many of the uh, public health agencies that are providing guidance around who should be vaccinated are including cancer as a uh, comorbid illness for the reasons I showed that cancer patients do less well when infected. So the, the, you know, the, the many public health agencies are prioritizing people with other illnesses for vaccination and considering cancer one of those things that should get you, you know, further up in the line. So uh, we think that most patients with cancer uh, should be able to undergo vaccination at the recommendations of their public health authority in a timely manner. It may not work quite as well, but we believe in the majority of patients it will still work with that caveat being those that are really going very intensive active chemotherapy that's immunosuppressive. So uh, I would say to any cancer patient who is worried about this, that they should consult with their doctor. They're probably going to be a candidate for vaccination and the vaccination will still offer some protection for them. The second question you had is, the, can you tell the symptoms apart? And generally you can. Most cancers uh, don't present like COVID. Most, you know, most present as something that hurts or there's a lump or there's maybe, maybe something bleeds that I ought not should, a hoarse voice. You know, there are many, many symptoms of cancer depending on what kind of cancer you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But most of those are, are easily discerned from COVID. There, you know, lung cancer can present as a cough and feeling tired and a flu. But I would say, so you know, it could be a little confusing in a few instances, but in general, uh, I, I think a, 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 comp a competent physician, a family practitioner, internist, or, you know, should be able to distinguish them relatively easily in most patients. Uh, the other one was about treatment priority. Uh, if you have cancer uh, and you want to get, but uh, is the question, if you have cancer, is the priority, should you get the vaccine or was it, should you? Uh, yeah, get yeah. The cancer, which one should be treated if there's a, uh, oh, you, mean, you mean cancer and COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That's going to come down again to the patient. So um, okay. many patients with cancer have what we call kind of indolent disease, meaning it's not active at that moment. And it, it, it can be, uh, we can not treat it for a while. We can just kind of watch it. So there's indolent prostate cancer, indolent lymphoma. Uh, those patients, should they develop COVID, should be treated for their COVID. I, absolutely. And, and, and the cancer is sort of just a uh, an element in their medical record. But there are other patients that are, are quite uh, sick from their cancers, and that has to be addressed at the same time. So those individuals are going to need care both for their cancer and their COVID. But we, you know, you can't ignore COVID either. So we, we think those individuals that have uh, active cancer and a new diagnosis of COVID really need to see uh, a, a physician who is familiar with those entities, their oncologist, presumably. And then lastly, the distribution of vaccines. Well, you had the world's expert on this topic, Tony, last week, so I, I doubt I can add much to what Tony said, but m my understanding is that uh, HH, Health and Human Services and Operation Warp Speed have now provided vaccine to the states, and that sort of the prioritization, prioritization schemes are now being really guided and driven by the, you know, the in your case, the Virginia uh, Public Health Authority. 
Are they, are they sending out information? What's that? Are they sending out information? Are they sending notices to different ones that need to come? Or, you know, the thought is we don't just walk in. So how is that going to be orchestrated? Yeah. Rob, do you, do you know how uh, Virginia is rolling out vaccination for uh, your state? Yeah, we have a 1A, 1B program. And uh, Dr. Norm Oliver, who is the commissioner of health here in Virginia, um, actually is going to rejoin Facts, Faith, and Friday to give us additional information about that. Um, but um, it, um, it is foremost on his mind. And also, um, I think Pastor Gray and others may know that um, we are really trying to work on trying to figure out how um, actually faith-based institutions may be able to even um, administer some of these vaccines. So stay tuned. I think it's, um, yes, it's yeah. interesting times. Just can I build on that again? So that was a real concern. Will they be sending out notices or things of that sort? Mm -hmm. And even I throw the idea out, don't need to discuss it, have a considered mobile medical units for going out and, and doing the vaccine. So those are just some other thoughts. But I, I thank you again, both of you, Dr. Wayne and Dr. Shabbos. <laughs> thank you. I, I predict uh, Dr. Oliver is going to be much more helpful on this topic for what's specifically mm -hmm. going to happen in Virginia mm -hmm. than I'm able to be. But uh, Dr. Emmanuel Harris, uh, President, uh, Ministers Conference of Richmond, has a, a question. Dr. Harris. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, my question um, is kind of relates um, to clergy who've been diagnosed with COVID. Um, and they say generally after the 10th day that if you don't have symptoms in the fever that you're considered okay. Um, but many of us pastor churches with a lot of high risk people, um, i.e. cancer patients, um, a ton in my church. Um, so um, is the recommendation because the CDC guidance is pretty much after the 10th day that you're clear to go back. Um, but I myself as a precautionary step retested two days ago. And I'm in my 16th day, but I'm still showing positive. And they say, you're probably not contagious. But again, when it comes to be, me being asked to do graveside funerals or anything, I still don't feel comfortable going around people who are already high risk, who are already afraid. Um, so do you have any clarity on that guidance? Because the guidance seems to be, they say you may test for two months. Maybe you're contagious, maybe not. But we can't deal with maybes. <laughs> um, in doing what we do. We have to know for certain um, that before I go around my membership that they're gonna be okay. And of course, we always have worn mask and, and social distance, but I got this like doing all that too. Um, so I, I wanna just be clear about that, that we have all the protocols, temperature checks, that's been going on the entire time. Um, but um, the question is, you know, is it safe for clergy who've been diagnosed who are still testing positive to go back around their members? And question number two, if we're out of that, if we're in the 16th day still showing positive, can we take the vaccine as well? Are we good to take the vaccine? And we're, and we're not, and I'm not showing a fever for the last five or six days. Right, okay, those are great questions. And for, first off, um, I'm so glad to hear your, your your worry is such for your, your, your fellow man, your, your, your congregants. I mean, that, that is really the way we have to think about this. It's not, you know, in, in the pandemic, we all think about like, what's my risk of something bad happening, but really, um, you know, the, the worst part about this is that uh, even people that don't get sick from COVID can still transmit it and uh, propagate the, the, the pandemic. And, and so we really have to think about our, 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 our neighbors as well. Uh, and so your, your concerns are very appropriate and laudable. Um, so that I didn't mention it, but the National Cancer Institute actually has a, a vibrant research portfolio in COVID research. We, we've done a lot of research on this topic uh, because of expertise that we have scientifically in virology and vaccinology and whatnot. And so we were actually uh, asked by Congress to study this topic of like what happens to people who've had COVID but are then immune. You know, uh, what, what do we know about such individuals? So the first thing that we've learned uh, is what you already said, is that people can be positive on that nucleic acid test for really 90 days after infection. So that's three months. So that's a long time to be, you, if they go in and get tested, they, they're, they're positive. And, and, and no one is recommending quarantine for periods that long. That would be unreasonable. So the CDC has given the advice that you mentioned, which is to uh, quarantine for some period after symptoms resolve. I mean, did you have symptoms, by the way? Did you even? 
fever okay. was my main symptom. Right. Yeah. yeah, some people didn't have any symptoms and they just have a positive test and they don't know how long to, you know, when my symptoms stop, right? So if you had symptoms and they went away, that proves really that your immune system fought this thing off. You made antibodies. If we measured your antibodies, you'd have them probably very, very, very likely. And, uh, and, and, and now you're just shedding what we think is nucleic acid that the test detects. But we think your risk of infecting others is quite low. But we don't, think, we don't know if it's zero because there are just a lot of, may, you know, we all hate maybes, but there's just a lot of maybes with a new virus we never had before. We don't have enough experience yet to know what to do. So the CDC has recommended what you described is some period, and I believe it is now 10 days, although at, at one point it was 14, I think they've shortened it, uh, uh, some period of uh, not going out until after symptoms resolve and then return to work. And certainly many employers are using that, that guide in, at the NCI and NIH, that's how we're handling such employees. We're letting them come back after that period of, uh, being, of symptom resolution. So I, I think that is um, the, the, the best we can do right now. I entirely endorse your, you know, continuing the social distance, continuing to wear a mask, continuing to uh, do everything you can to minimize spread because we think that someone like you who's recovered from infection is very unlikely to be infectious, but we still just don't have enough experience yet with this virus to know that for sure. There are clearly a few individuals, they're very rare, but they exist, who do get reinfected, who, you know, clear the virus and get better, and then they get the virus back. And so when they have that next, you know, so a nucleic acid test that's positive doesn't always mean just persistent shedding. Occasionally, it can mean reinfection, although we think that's very, very uncommon. The other question you had is, is when should you get the vaccine? Uh, and, and my answer there would be um, as soon as possible. Uh, however, um, the, uh, the CDC has said, I, I don't know if they've made it into a formal recommendation, but they have uh, you know, uh, opined that uh, individuals who've recovered from infection might defer vaccination, postpone that vaccination for like that 90 day period. Not because they're worried the vaccine won't work or it's dangerous or any of that stuff, but because you know, if you already have great antibodies and immunity, uh, the vaccine you know, may not benefit you as much. And so your chance of deriving maximum benefit that will last longer may be greater if there's some period uh, between the infection. So there is a... Um, it's unclear if it's a formal recommendation yet, but certainly discussion at the CDC as to whether or not people who've recently reco recovered should delay for up to 90 days. Uh, but, but that's all really complicated information. And I, I think in general, uh, individuals with these kinds of questions should discuss it with their doctor. And when their public health authority calls them to get vaccinated, they should really do that unless there's a, a clear indication for the physician why they shouldn't do that. But in most cases, the you know, vaccination is gonna be really important to get herd immunity to protect everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sharpless. And um, just a reminder that much of this information, uh, particularly about where you can sign up uh, for vaccines uh, is on the Virginia Department Health website. Um, and remember every week we usually start off talking about which websites I use. Um, and uh, the Virginia Department of Health has an active website where particularly folks over 65 can sign up for the vaccine. And Reverend Harris, we're gonna be in touch with you and uh, so, you know, after this, we'll definitely be in touch with you, sir. Um, there is a question from Dr. Stephen Hewlett, uh, pastor of the Riverview Baptist Church. And uh, I'm looking at this question right now. And Dr. Sharpless, this is going to be a good one for you. So it, it's coming at you right now. Dr. Hewlett, Hewlett. Uh, I wonder if there, can you unmute? Um, uh, it, you know what, I, I will go ahead and read the question of uh, Dr. Hewlett is probably having some technical issues, um, but Pastor of Riverview Baptist Church, the question is, what should you eat and what shouldn't you eat in preventing cancer? Yeah, cancer and diet. Um, there's a, a lot of information on this topic, uh, but most of it, frankly, I, I don't think is, is great, is based on really strong science. So, you know, the, the dietary recommendations related to cancer are pretty minimal at present. Um, I'd say the overall advice is avoid carcinogens, you know, things we know cause cancer. So that's cigarette smoking, for example. 
there are occasionally uh, foods that can be contaminated with carcinogens, which is pretty unusual. Um, the second rule is try and stay thin. So obesity is associated with cancer. Uh, that is uh, unequivocally established now uh, with, with several kinds of cancer. And we, we think obesity may, as tobacco goes down and down and down, we believe obesity, which is epidemic in the United States, may become the leading cause of cancer in the United States, the leading preventable cause of cancer in the United States. And, and so, uh, you know, we don't make dietary recommendations so much about what you should or shouldn't eat. Just don't eat more than you need to so that you will stay thin because thin patients have less cancer than obese patients. And then uh, the last recommendation we, we, uh, we, we have pretty good data to support is, you know, more recent, but I think the evidence is becoming reasonably strong that some level of physical activity is important for presenting cancer. And part of the really uh, important work here has actually come from the National Cancer Institute Intramural Program. And we, we know now, like with large studies with people who wear Fitbits and stuff, so you can know how many steps they take a day, that individuals who are more active appear to get less cancer than people who are less active. And, and we don't know that there's a threshold. We think the more you do, the better. So 4,000 steps is better than 2,000 steps and 8,000 steps is better than 4,000 steps. So those are kind of the recommendations that we feel strong. Oh, and, and of course, uh, you know, other things like get your vaccines for hepatitis and HPV, you know, you can prevent cancer with vaccination. So those are recommendations that are very strong to prevent cancer, which is, you know, avoid things that cause cancer like cigarette smoke, uh, eat a healthy balanced diet that uh, on which you remain thin, uh, get appropriate vaccines and, and some uh, level of physical activity. Uh, the, the, those are what we are recommending now to all patients in order to try and prevent cancer. You know, people have a lot of questions, will this specific vitamin or will specific kind of food prevent cancer? And my general thing I say there is that, you know, if it's, if it's a nice food and you like to eat it, and it, 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 uh, sure, it, that, 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 that's not a bad idea for, as a cancer patient to consider those things or uh, to prevent cancer, consider those things. But the actual, you know, the, 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 there are generally not strong data that any specific food or specific uh, food will cause or prevent cancer. Uh, that's been harder to establish because those kinds of trials are very challenging to do. Thank you. And Dr. James Harris, pastor of Second Baptist Church, are you online? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. Start my video as well. Um, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharpless and Dr. Wen. Uh, my question, I, I submitted a question, but I think um, based on um, what I've been hearing, I have another question. And that is, um, is, there any positive cor is there any positive correlation between having been vaccinated for other things, all kinds of other things, pneumonia, shingles, and, uh, and so forth, having and the various vaccinations you take for international travel and all of that. Is there, is, can y'all hear me? You can. Okay. Is, is there any positive correlation between having been vaccinated over the years for all kinds of things um, and uh, a, a, um, a reduction in contracting uh, COVID? And is there any correlation between, and it, uh, uh, the doctor, you, you hinted at it, between taking vitamin D and vitamin C uh, and these other vitamins, magnesium, all these other things, and um, zinc and so forth. These are popular culture kinds of, uh, of remedies. I'm just asking, is there any, um, any uh, scientific basis for believing that these things may help, and um, and my only other my other question is, um, why is it that so many people get COVID in ways that don't seem to be discernible? I mean, I'm meeting people all the time who say that they wear a mask, they wear gloves, they practice social distancing, and so forth, and yet they have contracted uh, COVID nineteen and don't seem to have any, um, any, any way of identifying um, how they got it. I was talking to one of my uh, uh, church members uh, a few days ago who participated in a, um, a, a Christmas drive. It was a, a drive-through. Um, the people did not get out of the car. 
and um, everything was held outside. And he he caught COVID. He he claims from that activity, not just him, but it was like uh, eighteen other people participating in that outside uh, giveaway for Christmas who also contacted uh, contracted uh, COVID. So, do you have any wisdom, um, uh, Dr. Sharpless, on uh, the kind of, uh, of what I'm what I'm suggesting is? It seems like some people, from what they tell me, they have caught COVID randomly. However, you know, uh, I mean, I don't hear the scientists saying too much about the possibility of that. That's that's sure. the, that's the that's the question. Oh, the yeah, let me uh, let me take those in order. Uh, so first, you asked about the question of, of prior vaccination to things other than coronavirus and uh, uh, risk of infection, and, and I'm aware of no evidence that that is there's an association. We we think that um, you know we we don't understand why certain people seem uh, more susceptible to COVID, particularly bad outcome with COVID, but uh, I don't think there's any link to prior vaccination, uh, uh, certainly, certainly that I know of. Um, there have been reports about vitamin D levels and uh, COVID outcome. Uh, there have been a few studies. I, I think they, they haven't given consistent results. The problem with vitamin D levels is they correlate with other things like being sick or you know, not getting enough, uh, not, not, lack, of, lack of health in many other ways. So it's always hard to establish whether or not vitamin D supplementation would, you know, taking vitamin D pills would help patients. I, you know, I'm aware of many individuals who have uh, started supplementing with vitamin D uh, in the hopes of, uh, you know, preventing a bad COVID infection or whatnot. It's still unclear if that if that's a works or not. But uh, you know, vitamin D is is generally uh, something that most people can take safely. It's not terribly harmful, and and I think that uh, individuals who are doing that, uh, it's probably okay. And the last question you mentioned a, a really common experience, which is that individuals are acquiring COVID with, with sort of no sense of how they got it. And they are adhering to all the rules. They're wearing masks and socially distancing and, and um, you know, minimizing going out and sick contacts and whatnot. And despite, these, despite these measures, they still come down with it. And that is a, not an uncommon story that we've been hearing. Uh, and um, I, I think that speaks to the fact that this is a, a very you know, tricky virus. It, 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 it mostly seems to spread by so-called droplets, you know, when people cough and there's, there, there's expelled a little bit of virus in these particles, but there also seems to be spread by other mechanisms such as a, a, an aerosol form where it hangs in the air for a while and there are clear evidence, clear episodes of infection that way as well. So in other words, you know, the, the person who's got the virus doesn't have to be there at that moment. They may you know, cough and then go away and then someone else comes in the room and, and uh, it could be exposed through an aerosol route. Uh, and we also may have some uh, infection by surfaces, by contact, although we think that's less common as well, but that, that, that can help it, that, that may be able to happen too. So the routes of infection are, um, it's tricky. And this is why we don't recommend one thing for, you know, we don't say just wear a mask or, you know, just, you know, we, we, we recommend this sort of multi-layer approach, the, uh, many different habits, uh, the last and most important of which we think is the vaccine, but, you know, wearing a mask, socially distancing, hand washing, uh, you know, avoiding other individuals, uh, uh, six distance apart, you know, these kinds of things. All of that adds up, we think, to maximize one's chances of not getting COVID. But, you know, no single layer will do it in, uh, alone, which is why we recommend for the moment all of them. And, uh, and uh, eventually, uh, we believe we will start to see the levels of the virus come down in the community. There won't be just as many people who are infectious around, and then we'll see the, uh, the, 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 the run of new cases drop. But it's clear that even people who are doing a really uh, you know, rigorous job and trying to follow the rules, we still see those people occasionally get infected because uh, it's a sneaky virus. Yep. Um, I know we're coming to the top of the hour. Um, just a couple questions uh, left. Uh, Dr. Yvonne Bibbs, pastor of Sixth Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Bibbs, do you have a couple questions? Uh, are you on mute? Um, well, I think I'm trying to get her there. Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Pastor Thank Bibbs. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Wynn, and um, certainly thank you, Dr. Sharpless, for answering questions that I had. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, is there any clinical data that supports the vaccine transcending into breastfeeding mothers? And sure. also, uh, should pregnant women take the vaccine? If not, how long do they wait post-birth? Right. So these are uh, questions that we don't, uh, pregnant women, for example, weren't included in, in the earlier studies. So we don't exactly know the answer to that. Uh, but, uh, and, and there were are, uh, studies intended to go on in these populations to answer these questions explicitly. So what uh, the recommendation is presently, that, that, that we, we believe that uh, pregnant women can be vaccinated safely. And uh, there's also even a possibility that if pregnant women make antibodies to the virus, they can transmit them to their baby while the baby's still in the uterus. So we, we do not think that uh, vaccination is necessarily dangerous in pregnant women, uh, but most uh, doctors are advising that's up to the, pay, to, to the woman, is to talk it over with her doctor, understand the risks of vaccination versus the benefits during a pregnancy, and have a difficult discussion. Uh, you know, it's, it, because there's, it's difficult in that we don't know what the right answer is because we don't have actual clinical trials data to answer that yet. Uh, the uh, other question about uh, transmitting something bad to the baby because of the vaccination, we, we don't think there's any risk in that. We think that nursing mothers can be safely vaccinated, for example, and uh, we don't believe that that is um, a dangerous thing to do. And in fact, what would be dangerous is for the mom to get COVID and get really sick while she has a nursing baby. So we think the risks of the vaccination are, or, are, are, are much lower than the risks of getting COVID and getting ill uh, to her uh, baby. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sharpless, I know that um, I've been charged with the timekeeper. I would like that you to know that you have a number of other questions uh, in the context of cancer and some other things, and maybe we can have you back at some point. Uh, but we want to th thank you uh, for sharing this information with us. Um, and I just want to say, you know, again, thank you for being the leader of the NCI. Thank you for everything you do. You're a great role model for many of us, but more importantly, you're just an inspirational leader. So thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been really a lot of fun. It's great to see everyone virtually. And, uh, and, and thank you for your work on behalf of the public health you're doing to try and, you know, educate the community of Virginia and really, um, you know, improve outcomes for patients with cancer and patients with COVID. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and uh, I hope to do come back someday. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think uh, Sister Rudine, um, uh, we'll turn the mic over to you and then uh, Pastor Gray will take us out, but oh. Well, thank you um, very much. I'm so glad we had a chance to talk with Dr. Sharpless. Um, he mentioned the state admission mission of NCI um, is to end cancer suffering. As many of you know, as pastors and lay leaders, it's our mission to end human suffering in general. So I, I really appreciate the questions from all the, the pastors who are on the line today and thank you for, for being here. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Pastor Gray to close us out in prayer. And I, I do want to thank all of our colleagues that participated in the discussion. As ever, I'm going to thank Dr. Wynn and Rudine, VCU, and all those that made this possible. And I don't know, Lindsay, if, if Lindsay, Lindsay is still on here, I, I do want to give a shout out to Lindsay because Lindsay facilitates all this. Uh, and even though she is not uh, seen visually, uh, she's one of the great facilitators for our Faith and Facts Friday. So I thank God for her. Let's bow. Lord, for all that we have received this day, we pray that we would digest it and apply it. We thank you for those that loan of their time and their talent, that we might be better informed. We pray your presence upon us, even as we seek to be faithful to our congregants and community, that you might use us, that we might be able to bless them, that they might live more healthy, fruitful, and productive lives in these turbulent times. We pray your spirit would not only bless us during the pandemic, but bless us during some of these, these crazy days. We pray that you would bring us together, that we might be able to be a, 
a more united nation and that we might be a more faithful people. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good MLK weekend, everybody. All right, do the same. Be blessed.